Thank you, uh, <clears throat> Mr. De Beclair, for those remarks. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, David and Julia and Cambridge, for bringing together this a great group of people to uh, discuss and debate, I, th I think, what are and will continue to be some critical issues over the next few years. Uh, the speakers on the first panel expertly set out and clearly set out the background to the case and all of the issues, so I'm, in the interest of brevity, not going to touch on that. I intend to talk about Google's response and to give some insight into uh, my practical experience and Google's practical experience in implementing the judgment. Right from the start, right from this landmark ruling, Google made it clear that although we didn't exactly uh, welcome the judgment, uh, we respected it and it was our job uh, to make it work. Um, I'm very proud of the hard work that our teams have put in over the last 10 months to give effect to the individual rights that the court confirmed in this judgment. As of 23rd of March, and as is publicly available in our transparency report, which I'll talk more about in a minute, Google had received 843,000 individual uh, delisting requests with respect to URLs, representing nearly 232,000 individual requests. Uh, roughly speaking, we delist in 41% uh, of cases um, and uh, d decline to delist in 59% of cases. We publish a full transparency report at google.com slash transparency report where you can see these statistics that w which are regularly updated in terms of the volumes of requests we're seeing and what our removal ra rates look like. There is also a national breakdown, so you can see what those statistics and percentages look like at a country level. So that's a lot of volume of stuff, and I think it's fair to say that's a lot of work. Uh, to, to individually assess 843,000 URLs takes a bit of doing. And uh, you know we moved very quickly to comply. Uh, we were very quick to launch a web form, setting up a process to manage these requests. We were very quick to engage with data protection authorities to hear what they had to say uh, on the subject. And we listened to a wide spectrum of views through the advisory council process that we established. Now, let me say that our approach has been largely consistent with the recommendations of European experts and regulators. But there are still areas of disagreement, some of which I'll touch on when I talk today. Um, uh, conflicts of law and jurisdiction are never easy, uh, since fundamental rights are at stake. Uh, and fundamental rights are weighed differently in different countries and different parts of the world. But we are committed to listening to the debates across Europe as this issue uh, evolves. So moving on to our experiences of the last 10 months, the first thing that we did um, after we read the judgment was to stand back and say, okay, we need to have a way of receiving these requests. We were conscious that we needed the right amount of data to do the job. We didn't want to create an open channel where uh, basically individuals would supply more information than, than was relevant for our purposes in assessing their request. And so we thought to ensure that we were only collecting the right data uh, from individuals, we would launch uh, a web form. And we put a great deal of thought uh, into the design of that web form and how it was structured. Um, I'll call out the main pieces of information we, we ask for when someone wants to file a, a delisting request. We ask for the name used to search, more about that later. We ask for the contact email address. Uh, we also ask for an explanation for each URL. Uh, again, more on that later. Um, and then we also basically then remove on name query searches. So that was very clear from the court's judgment that the ruling was limited to name query searches. Uh, and so not removing links for any or all search uh, results pages, which could be overboard and is clearly not required by the ruling. We focused uh, on e EU users. Uh, our web form makes it clear that individuals need to select a relevant country. Practically, individuals will need some connection to that country, which will normally but not always mean that they have to be resident in it. Individuals need to select a country so that we know which law to apply 
um, because there are divergences of practice with national authorities, as I'll come on to a minute, uh, in a minute. And so that it, it, it's clear which DPA the complaint should be remitted to. That's a practical problem, and our solution is the web form. We focused on EU domains. We currently remove an EU plus EFTA states. We noticed early on that some data protection authorities called for pan-EEA consistency, and we wanted to support that effort. The most logical legal interpretation of this opinion is actually for national removals. But for Google, we thought it was right to take a pan-EU approach to encourage consistency and harmonization for individuals. When we remove a search result related to an individual's name, it will simultaneously be removed from all European versions of Google search. We do not remove on services targeted to non-European countries, including our US service on .com. When individuals search on .com, we already redirect them to the local relevant domain. In practice, the vast, vast majority of our users use these local domains. We do not think the court's ruling is global in reach. It's an application of European law that applies to services offered to European consumers. We have a long established way of complying with country specific laws by removing from the version of our service that tar targets that country. For example, uh, google.de in Germany. This is, uh, this is how we've always processed national law removals for national law claims, like hate speech, to use one example, and defamation to use another. The services in those domains are tailored for users in those countries in a number of ways. It's not just about legal compliance. They're intended to be the best experience for the user in that country overall. Another key aspect of Google's implementation of this judgment we felt very deeply that we needed to be transparent about both the results and about the process that Google was running. So we have a generic notice at the bottom of our search results that when a user enters a name query search for most names about a person, that information uh, uh, will be displayed. Um, now, let me be clear that the, the notice that fires on the bottom of our search results page is not a notice that is fired with respect to any specific removal. It is a notice that is fired with respect to most named <coughs> query searches. And we think it's important to give our users information about the results that they are seeing um, and how those results have been compiled. Uh, also, we think it's important to notify webmasters. This is consistent with our approach in other removals. We, we are giving webmasters the link or URL that will no longer appear in search results in response to a name query search, not any details of the request. We have long done this for other uh, in other areas of law, not just for removals made on data protection grounds. We've also let people know on the web form so that they're aware that this will happen. We believe it's important to let third party publishers know when we stop linking to their sites in response to some queries. And we've already started seeing complaints from webmasters about the prospects of removing <coughs> links to their sites, and we're already facing challenges from publishers about removal decisions that result in reduced traffic to their sites. We provide this feedback to ensure transparency and address those criticisms directly. We have received communications from webmasters that have caused us to reevaluate removals and reinstate them. In some situations, uh, third party publishers may want to publish the underlying content. With the right to be forgotten, of course, uh, we as uh, Google, the data controller with respect to search, have a duty, have a legal obligation to assess each case. Uh, however, um, sometimes you know, users may get the perception that filling out a form on Google removes it from the original source. And so actually notifying webmasters may uh, alert the original source to uh, the user's uh, position with respect to the material in a way that actually produces a practical result for the individual. In others, webmasters can identify whether, where an accusation takes traffic away from their site um, was, or was mistaken or inaccurate. Okay, and uh, next I want to turn to this issue of what kind of information we have when we make the decision. Um, well, clearly there's this large carve out for public interest and we had to decide how to apply that. When we assess a request, we have the information from the web form and we have the material from the site. 
we do not have any information from the publisher or speaker. And, and, and we think it's important to ensure balance in the process that um, we have that opportunity. There are, of course, no journalistic exemptions for search engines. That was made clear by the ruling. Um, but um, at the moment, there is no established way for uh, a publisher or speaker to feed back uh, or, or to be aware that a particular name query search uh, has been delisted. We'll continue to give careful thought to these issues, but we believe we're taking the right approach. However, we recognize that there's a spectrum of strongly held views on these issues across Europe, within the privacy community, and even differing views among European data protection authorities. As we continue to discuss these issues with data protection authorities and others, as we evolve our processes, um, we will you know, continue to keep an open door and an open mind as to what comes next. For example, we recently uh, introduced a policy not to send webmaster notifications to certain categories of sites, such as malicious porn sites, as I have noted um, previously. <coughs> um, as most of you know, the criteria laid down by the CGAU were fairly vague. We worked hard to develop criteria to apply to the uh, myriad of real-world situations, some of which I'm going to talk about, which we faced uh, when, when dealing with the requests that came before us. It was a broad ruling with little guidance on application. Our challenge, was to, uh, our challenge is to evolve our approach. We accept that our policies and practices will change over time based on what, what, we, what, what we hear from data protection authorities and what we hear from courts. In that respect, we welcome uh, the guidance of the Article 29 Working Party um, we were comforted by the fact that much of the removal criteria uh, was similar to the removal criteria that we had already developed and were implementing. And actually, um, that consistency between the approach that we were taking and the recommendations of the working party was comforting for me and, 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 and others at Google. Um, I want to turn a little bit to the, to, to the guidelines and, 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 and some of the ways that Google thinks about the issues internally and some of the trends that we're, we're seeing. Uh, we want to be thoughtful and pragmatic about where we decline to, to, to delist. Uh, a big area is public figures, where we have a general expectation that we will do fewer removals. So I'll give you a couple of examples of cases where we have refused to remove footballer who wanted to remove a news article about his career highlights, a TV star who wanted us to remove news articles about uh, a recent sex scandal. It could also be a figure in the public eye because of uh, what they do in their professional uh, life. Uh, we've had removal requests covering a respected scientist who wanted to remove criticism of his uh, scientific work. Um, and you know, there are challenges here. Uh, pub but even public figures, um, are, you know, uh, basically, when you're looking at these news stories, you have to take into account um, that they have a public persona and a private persona. And some of the some of the calls are are difficult, and we're seeking to develop more nuanced criteria as we move forward. Another area of contention is news stories. Uh, when someone is mentioned as a meaningful part of a news story. Um, again, that's a, a real indicator for us that that might be something that we would decline to delist. If the source is a reputable news story, if we're dealing with a recent article, um, then uh, you know clearly, generally having access to this information, we feel is in the public interest. We do not. Uh, uh, so, so, so there are challenges around that. Another area of challenge is political speech, and, and to give you uh, some examples of areas where we've pushed back. Um, members of the government requesting removal of news articles about their a corruption scandal, uh, police, police officers involved in con uh, being convicted of bribery uh, and corruption or having disciplinary charges in relation to bribery and co corruption levied against them, pushing back on a request from a member of government requesting the removal of, of posts of citizens criticising uh, policies. So, and these are these are real, real, real examples. And there are really, really difficult examples in in political speech. We get a lot from uh, people who want to clean up their 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 past at university. Who say, "I was involved in a political society at university, and you know, I'm no longer active in public life, and I want to remove or delist 
name query search information in relation to uh, the statements I made at that time. Uh, in some cases, they say that when they are, in fact, running for political office. <laughs> and uh, in some cases, they say that when, uh, you know, uh, you know, when, when clearly what they are doing is trying to, to, to limit the field of information that is available online. Um, so these are challenges, and where we draw the line on these is something that we will continue to uh, uh, kind of uh, evaluate. I, I want to move on to one area. I want to move on to some trends then and, and some issues that we're seeing. Um, complaint volumes to data protection authorities from what we can see at this point are, are relatively low in relation to the 840 uh, odd thousand uh, uh, URLs we've received removal requests for. Uh, very low. I'd put them in the hundreds. I see every one of them personally, and I'd put them, I'd put them in the hundreds. But let me try and draw out um, some of the uh, things that we're seeing. Uh, we've got some data protection authorities who are ordering us to remove government records simply on the basis that the government site is the right place to find that government record um, and that there is no public interest in linking to it from a search engine in response to a name query search. We've got some complex cases involving defamation where um, it's not clear to us or the Data Protection Authority whether the content in question is true or not, but we're nonetheless being ordered to remove. And, and, and again, I'd, I'd, I'd welcome and call out the Article 29 Working Party's guidance on defamation in, in that respect. Um, as one might expect, um, the criteria on past crimes and when it's appropriate to remove a past crime diverge significantly nationally. Um, uh, even if you, one has common criteria, there are individual rules across Europe and in various countries with respect to the treatment of past crimes. And so we are seeing uh, difference in standards there in the, in the way that uh, data protection authorities are approaching the issue. Um, recency is an issue. We often get asked, well, how many years for this and how many years for that? And we have to say, well, we have to adjudge each individual case in all of its merits. So our approach is much more dynamic in that. We look at a range of factors and we don't draw hard lines because that would be uh, inappropriate. Um, and we also have, as I mentioned before, sensitive issue and political uh, content. Um, uh, and these issues tend to cause uh, uh, difficulties. Um, we've got one case at the moment where we've been asked to remove a, a re-reported case, so that something that you know, had been removed and then a newspaper has reported on the fact that there was a removal and we've got one request from a data protection authority to remove um, that re-reported case. Um, uh, so, you know, I, 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 you know some, some trends starting to emerge for sure. Um, I'd also like to call out the work of our advisory council. We welcome all their advice and guidance and we're considering carefully how to uh, implement that. I'd also like to point out that advisory council members do not adjudicate on individual cases. That I think there's been some public misunderstanding about that. So to, clo to, to, so to close, which is handy because I've got the one minute flag, so I seem to be at the right point in my preso, our approach will not be static. We know it will change over time and we know that data protection authorities will have guidance for us. We plan to learn through experience. We remain committed to engaging in thoughtful collaboration with the working party and with individual data protection authorities to discuss these issues further. In parallel, across Europe, national courts are starting to build a body of jurisprudence to interpret and apply the CGSU's decision. Over time, collectively, we're gaining experience in processing removals and developing a better understanding of the implications of the judgment. We know that DPA's views will differ from our own in some cases, just as DPA's would reach, would reach different decisions amongst themselves in, in, in some cases. But we will only push a case if there is a public interest in clarifying uh, the position. We know that uh, tough debates lie ahead, such as on scope of removals and the rights of publishers in the process. We think it's important to have those debates openly and respectfully. Our door is open, uh, we're listening, and we want to work with those in the room and data protection authorities as we move forward.